Okay, so the, uh, the first thing we've got uh, on the agenda for today is an overview of the changes that we've made to the open rack specification for 2.0, which mainly uh, adds uh, uh, a 48 volt uh, bus bar into the rack and also um, um, adds a lot more detail to the, the 12 volt that we've uh, uh, had previously in the specification. Um, so to kind of kick it off, I want to introduce uh, Mike. Um, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Yeah, you, you're mic'd up. Hi, I'm Mike Lapp. I'm a mechanical engineering tech lead manager for Google. Um, my name is Xin. Um, I'm a technical lead manager for uh, Power Team from Google. So here's kind of the topics that we're going to go through today. So we're going to just kind of give you a real quick overview of what was going on. We'll have uh, kind of a deeper dive into the mechanical changes, and then uh, Shin will go through the power changes and some of the rack management stuff that we've added into the specification. Yeah. Yep, yep, everything that you see today will be accessible, not, not just this one, but uh, every presentation, um, and uh, there'll also be a video of everything that'll also be uh, published as well, so you can just relax and enjoy the show. <laughs> <laughs> So here's kind of just a real quick overview of what, uh, what was going on. Um, so there's now two different depths that are uh, recognized in the specification right now. So there's the original spec that, uh, um, which supported more of a 1,000, uh, 1,046-millimeter rack, which was more of like an 800-millimeter deep uh, IT sled. And then there's a shorter version as well. Um, there's basically all the components that are required to build an entire ecosystem related to the 48 volt. Um, so there's, there's bus bar specification, the shelves, everything that you need is now uh, set up in the specification. So um, kind of one of the theories that we've got in, uh, in the specification is that it really is focused on just the bare minimum that it takes to allow the components to uh, uh, interact with each other, right? So we, we tried to minimize the stuff that we were constraining to allow as much flexibility as possible. So none of this allows for a complete and total definition of any particular product. Um, for example, like the, uh, the rack specification doesn't tell you how tall it is or, or how deep it is. Um, it really just controls the interfaces between the rack and the bus bar. So that way, depending upon uh, what the uh, community is looking for, right, you can, uh, you can still tailor the rack quite a bit to your particular needs. Um, so um, you'll see, hopefully, coming up here in the next year in the group, there'll be additional sp specific uh, product definitions that come out. And then there'll be products that are uh, submitted that are um, against those particular specifications that we can then get OCP accepted. So that's kind of the, over this next year, hopefully, we'll be able to get some products that have OCP acceptance against uh, these specifications. Uh, nope. Oh, oh, there we go. All right, Mike. There you go. Hi, good morning. Thanks for joining us at nine in the morning.
shallow and the deep rack. So the latch to stop dimensions for the IT gear retention, that's what we should be looking for. And part of this is defining where the rack level bus bar location is. So when we st stuck with the specification, we wanted to make sure that everything always blind mated. And part of it is there are different ways that the power systems are connecting. Uh, some, some of the uh, suppliers will design for a direct bolt on to the bus bar. Uh, this is typically what we've been seeing for the 12 volt applications. But for the 48 volt applications, we've tried to go with the same uh, t type of technique except we're also introducing a new method of direct blind mate. Since we're going to 48 volts, your currents are gonna be lower. So depending on your power system, this could change. And what we've done is when we defined the bolt-on locations for the bus bar, it's actually behind the mating interface towards the front of the bus bar. So we're keeping the front of the bus bar constant for the entire height of the rack. So this is a top section uh, cross-section view. And we actually keep the same cross-section that mounts within the rack between the 48 volt and 12 volt. So if you already own a 12 volt rack, uh, there's a potential that if you're staying within the same supplier, you could put the bus bar in with as a module. Over time, we may see uh, some changes where the bus bar can move between different rack suppliers, and that becomes much more modular. The bus bar as it's defined on the left side, that's our 48 volt bus bar, and we leave the rear section as a volume for expansion on the bus bar. So, the front section is what we really want to hold constant because we want to keep all the connectors the same throughout all the products. But in the rear, if you needed more power, you can have a different extrusion, you have additional uh, attachments that can raise the power of the rack. Uh, walking the Expo floor, I've actually seen two different applications of this. Some are uh, sheet metal, uh, not, not sheet metal, but like a plate copper uh, that are running the entire length and another version is a extrusion. So, the 48 volt bus bar features, they are alignment guided for power and return. So if you look at the connectors that are available, they will guide in. And part of the reason is for safety. At 48 volts, we want to make sure that nobody accidentally uh, pushes a, uh, a foreign object into the bus bar and causing a to cause a short. So that's what we've done with the uh, 48 volt bus bar. Another thing to mention is compared to the 12 volt bus bar, we have recessed the, uh, the electrical uh, contact area just a little bit just for that safety reason. And onto the topic of power distribution interconnects. Um, actually, sorry, I'm gonna go back for one more slide. Uh, so where we mount the, ra the uh, rack level bus bar, we are maintaining all three positions within the rack. That's not something that we've taken out of the spec. It's just when you go to 48 volts, chances are you will only need uh, one center centralized bus bar. So the, the V2 spec is also applies to the 12 volt rack. As for power distribution interconnects, we've been focusing a lot on the vertical bus bar. And that's what is shown on the, uh, the right side with this yellow section. That's what we've primarily focused on within open compute. But there's actually no reason why we don't apply some of these same basic concepts to the shelf level. And that's also defined in the appendix of the open rack V2 spec. And we wanna get to a point of you know, low cost, efficient rack level and shelf level bus bars. Many of these interconnects have uh, very discrete locations. You're, you're designing for uh, two wide sleds or three wide sleds. And as we've seen throughout the expo, it's like there, are inch, there is interest in having a, a configuration where you go down to 19 inch or 20 inch, but you'll have to redesign part of the, the ways the, uh, the power is doing the interconnect. So when you get to a common power delivery interconnect across different payload product lines, and some of the, the other reason we're doing some of these changes is the bus bar and the connector configuration, it prevents accidental connection of a 12 volt gear uh, into 48 volts. So that's actually one of the main things we want to, to plan for. So going into a little bit more detail of how you can use the shelf level bus bar. So the spec of the interface is defined within the spec itself. But some of the ways that you can use it is you, now you will have a pitch agnostic IT tray power delivery. So one way to think about it is you can design just one type of IT gear shelf and you have multiple widths of IT trays. Uh, for an example, uh, we see a lot of the three wide sleds, but there could be some that are too wide. And the IT gear connector is the one that interfaces the shelf to the vertical bus bar. 
but we wanna, what we also want to look at is the shelf level bus bar. And just with essentially two thin sheets of copper, you can get to up to around 150 amps just on one shelf. So depending on what you're designing, it can be one OU, two OUs, whatever height you need, it should be able to handle a decent amount of power for what you're trying to do. The other interesting thing is when you're applying the same bus bar concept to the horizontal shelf level, you're also providing flexible horizontal position of the connector within the IT tray itself. I know there's a lot of mechanical engineers out there where you're trying to place a connector in a particular location, but you really wanted a fan in a particular location. This way you can move the connector anywhere within the IT tray and still mate within the bus bar and place it anywhere within the horizontal shelf of the rack. So if you have multiple of these in there, you can uh, move your payloads around and you don't have to worry about, oh, where is the blind mate connector? And what you're really focusing on is the vertical alignment of the connector versus left to right. So you're taking one piece of that out of the equation. jumping around a little bit. So a, these are some images of the 48 volt bus bar interconnects that are available today. Uh, not all of these are the, the final renderings, but we are making all of these available. So they will be panel mounted floating connectors at the back of the IT gear and the IT trays. So on the left is the IT gear rack level bus bar connector. This is set up vertically. So the IT gear and IT tray connectors are different connectors. Uh, they have a different stack up for the thickness, but they will be available, they're used in different ways and they're also scalable. We're not defining exactly how much power is within the connector, but if you need more power, you can grow the height. So instead of adding more pins, you would just grow the height of the connector, there's more contacts, different surface area, and that's how you would get to more power. So it'll be a vertical orientation for mating with the rack level bus bar, and it'll be in a horizontal orientation with an addition of a chassis ground connection for mating at the shelf level bus bar. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think this is, I think Shin is up next for, yeah. There we go. Does it work? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, um, Today, um, I'm here to talk about, uh, you know, really a very high level of uh, the power requirement or specifications that we uh, incorporated into the OpenRack V2 version. Um, let's take a look on the, hopefully it works. Uh, no. All right. So let's take a look on the, this is a, you know, overview of all the power requirement uh, that has been included in this OpenRack V2 version. Um, from the beginning, um, you know, we define a, a overall electrical requirement or power requirement for both 12 volt and 48 volt. So this is more uh, on the level of, you know, the, the power distribution uh, pass on, for example, the connectors and and bus bar lever uh, electrical requirements. Um, the second one we uh, we put it into we have included into the spec is it's a, it's, it's an interesting topic I guess. Um, uh, you know, 48 volt is uh, relatively new to uh, OCP community. Um, I think there's a lot of challenges on designing, especially on the onboard power lever, right? Uh, especially from the beginning. Uh, so we try to kind of sharing our uh, practice and put a a quite extensive level of guidance into how you design your uh, 48 volt power system for server storage and server and, and switches. Right? Um, we have a little bit more detail in the in the following slide um, about that. And then, of course, as part of the power system uh, from the rack, you know, power shelf is always a major component. So. Um, Facebook actually take a, a further step to also add a 12 volt power shelf specification into the uh, the OpenRack V2. You know this this wasn't the case for uh, the previous version. 
Um, and then we also include uh, some of the implementation options, right? Um, you know, we're talking about 48 volt, we are talking about 12 volt. So it's really the output of the power system, you know, how you distribute the power. So we really didn't actually limit it, the, for example, the input uh, voltage, right? You know, it could be a single phase, it could be a single phase AC, it could be a three phase AC, it could be high, high voltage uh, DC distribution or even a a, you know, just the 48 volt uh, power distribution. Um, but, you know, we, we, we try to put a, a options for system implementation for actually as AC single, uh, AC, um, a single phase AC to 48 volt rectifiers into it. So when, you know, power system uh, vendors who want to design a, a rectifier and say, they have some, you know, specifications that they can refer to to design their system. Um, it's actually quite, um, uh, with quite a lot of details in, 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 into it. And uh, this is not really a standard that we, we put it into the, the specification. Instead, we actually include these two things, you know, the battery backup unit and, and the AC single phase rectifier into the appendix portion of, uh, of the specification as a, a option to, uh, uh, for implementation. Okay. Um, this is, uh, you know, when we talk about tail volt, right? So this is not really new to, uh, uh, to this specification. And I think it's almost the same as, as a previous specification regarding the tail volt. So you can see actually the volt is, uh, is a relatively narrow range. Uh, and you know, it's also specified the current density and uh, output ripple, and this is, this is uh, mainly come, uh, coming from uh, Facebook uh, team, actually. Uh, regarding the 48 volt uh, electrical requirement, um, um, so th this is a new portion for this specification, and you can actually easy to notify that um, you know, the operating voltage range is relatively uh, wide, is from 40 volt to 59.5, right? The reason we put 55, 59.5 volt there is, you know, the safety reason, right? <laughs> you know, there's the, um, uh, you know, the SELV circuit is defined to be a, a DC voltage lower than 60, right? So that's kind of the reason. Um, this wide range of voltage, uh, this wide voltage range does create a little bit challenging by, uh, to, to design the downstream uh, 48 volt to point of load uh, power conversion, right? Because, you know, basically your, your voltage regulator needs to be designed to support a, a relatively large voltage range. Um, but it does provide some new features and benefits that we can see in terms of, uh, for example, uh, battery integrations, right? So you basically can uh, potentially eliminate a, a power conversion from your uh, from your battery units, right? You can theoretically just tie up your battery units into the bus bar. Uh, the other, I think the other benefit we have seen is, uh, you know, since the, the voltage range is relatively large, so it actually could uh, tolerate more voltage loss, you know, uh, of, uh, fluctuation of the voltage. Um, and, uh, one thing to uh, highlight here is actually the aluminum voltage is 54.5 volt, right? Um, even this is what we call the 48 volt uh, system. Yeah. Right. So um, again, I think what's what was mentioned, um, you know, as part of the specification, we also uh, include a very detailed information about the uh, power requirement for a IT tray lever, um, onboard lever power, uh, power design. Uh, you know, it includes operating input voltage, which is the same as, uh, um, as what is showing in the uh, 48 volt electrical requirement. And it also includes all the detail of how you design hot swap circuits. Um, you know, it, it defines all the creepage clearance you, you needed to design a a, a um, power circuits to meet the safety requirement. Um, it has all the detail about, you know, uh, how you're monitoring your, your power, um, 
what kind of considerations you need to take into account when you you design your hot swap circuit. So theoretically, um, you know, if any of the suppliers um, who are interested of doing a 48 volt hot swap controller, they can refer to this specification because it has you know a a, a lot of details into it. Um, and theoretically, they can basically just refer to the specification and, and define a hot, hot swap controller for a 48 volt system. Um, same thing, we, we put some you know, efficiency targeting for uh, some of the VR rails, uh, you know, uh, big power rails and then small power rails. Um, and we recommended to have the 48 volt to point of load direct uh, voltage regulator to be used in, this, in the CPU rail and DDR rails. And there are some features about the power monitoring as well, uh, which is included in, in, in this portion. Um, again, uh, for, uh, so this specification uh, includes both 12 volt and 48 volt power shelf. And you know, the power shelf is basically the, uh, the centralized the power delivery component for the, for the right lever, right? So um, it could be a power shelf for rectifiers, uh, it could be a a power shelf for uh, batteries, or it could be a combination, right? We, we don't put that kind of limitations over there. Um, does require some features about, you know, M plus one redundancy. Um, in terms of serviceability, we actually um, limit it to a front access only. Um, and Mike already introduced some of the DC connection to, you know, how you make your connection from your uh, power shelf to, to the bus bar for power distribution. Um, these are the two options that we uh, we mentioned um, um, as a imp implementation options. So, um, especially I think on the AC single phase 48 volt rectifiers, um, we have I don't know maybe more than 30 pages for uh, focus on that. So it has all the details um, about the efficiency targeting, uh, you know, voltage uh, protection lever, how you do overcurrent protection. Um, uh, same goal here, right? Uh, we try to put some guidance and and for uh, power uh, supply companies who can design the 48 volt rectifiers by referring to this specification. Uh, we put a, a pretty high level of uh, uh, specification on the battery backup up unit um, because battery is still kind of new technology, um, you know, in in data center. So we we try to not put in too much air limitation there, instead just putting some kind of minimum features there for, for people to start with. Oops. Uh, compliance requirements. Uh, you know, when we talk about racks, right, you know, they could potentially deploy into very different countries uh, across the, uh, the world. So, um, uh, as part of the specification, we um, we include all the compliance uh, requirements with all the details, you know, from safety and e uh, EMC um, perspective, and uh, um, and you know, it's it's basically uh, you know meeting compliance in the environment, which is intended to functional in different countries and meet the EMI uh, EMC requirement, safety requirement, um, to you know. Uh, to, to, to enable um, the RAG to be deployed into different countries. I, we have all the details in specification, you know, it's hard to kind of go through all the details here. Um, and then we have also a, a um, some limited information, uh, I would say, uh, into the specification about RAG management uh, controller. Um, I think this, the current situation now we found is, you know, um, there's a, a huge uh, variety uh, in terms of uh, solutions in rack management controller, you know, um, different companies have very different solutions, right? Um, you know, companies like Google, Facebook, they're doing very different things in, in this area as well. Uh, so it's, it's, it's extremely challenging to put a specification there or standard there. Um, that's what we found. So uh, instead, you know, as a, a, a compromise, um, we try to include a minimum features and of the the um, for for the rack management controller. So it's you know we we um, 
what is the minimum one is we actually want to see a Ethernet, a 100 mega um, Ethernet upstream for remote monitoring and the power components. That's kind of the, the minimum features we want to see. And this rack management could be part of your rack, you know, on the rack level, or could be part of your uh, power shelf level. Uh, so we, we don't put that kind of uh, physical limitation over there. Um, and could, you know, between if you put your rack management control inside of the shelf, you know, we also specify the communication protocols between the controller and, and the rectifiers and batteries, which is, uh, um, which is uh, showing here, right? It's CAN bus, US 232, and US 485. And I think that's all I have. I will turn it over to uh, Steve for a wrap up and also the uh, continued uh, development uh, activities that uh, is ongoing. Yeah, thanks, Shen. So, um, Thank you. So as we go forward, right, so there's uh, several areas where the current specification can use some uh, additional filling out. So um, as he's just showing, right, the rack management area is very uh, limited, right? It's more of a physical interface and there's a, a couple of the protocols, right? But there's lots of opportunity to go and kind of build on that to build that area out to something that's a little bit more, more uh, full-fledged than what we've got right now. So that's the kind of an area where um, hopefully we get some uh, interest in the community to kind of go and start driving uh, that particular area. Um, also, as we kind of look at kind of additions to the specification going forward, is um, I, I'd like to look at getting the uh, bus bar systems, whether they're both 12 volt and 48 volt, um, to the point that they're specified well enough that they can be uh, interchangeable accessories, right? So you'd be able to develop uh, bus bars from uh, different suppliers that we'd be able to bolt into the rack. Um, so build a, need to kind of build up the mechanical specifications between the rack and the bus bars to kind of help that interchangeability. So um, those are kind of another area where I think we can add some uh, additional information to the specification kind of as we go forward. Um, so if there's other areas, um, you know, from the community, right, where you would like to see, you know, additional topics added in or something like that. I mean, I'd love to hear your kind of feedback on um, what you think we should be doing next related to the specification. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The, so one thing, have, have you considered the, the plating issues, you know, bus bars, so those days? Uh, here we're with uh, Nicole and uh, Boros and Brooklyn's and versus the how to put the contact list in a, between the clip and bus bar. Sure. Sure. So right now we don't specify very specifically exactly what that plating should be. Um, so we, we've done quite a bit of work in the last couple of months. Um, and I think that's probably something that we could definitely add in there to be a little bit more prescriptive what we think the best choice for that is. Um, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, so right now the specification allows for both nickel and, and silver, um, but we could be a little bit more prescriptive or at least um, publish what we know right now um, related to kind of the best practices. And then we can decide whether we actually want to make that part of the standard or if we just want to leave that as a, as a best practice, but that's definitely something we can, we can offer up to the community. Yeah, because uh, currently uh, we've defined it as uh, the number of cycles of uh, mates and breaks. Slide over a little bit so they can see it. And as, part, as we move forward, I think one thing that we'll see is we'll start seeing different suppliers going on to the same type, like different bus bar, different connector manufacturer. So I think that's definitely one area we're going to drive towards. So once we can define those, we can guarantee some good reliability between the, inter the interconnect system, especially between different brands. Anything related to kind of additional stuff you'd like to see? Yeah. Um, you, you alluded to kind of the overall process of the specification and a product mm -hmm. submission. I, I think it'd be good to kind of review like a, how you can envision, you know, so here's a spec and then you have a manufacturer who wants to create a product and it can go accepted or expired, that type of thing. But, sure, sure. Yeah. So from a, from a process standpoint, so again, we've tried to put the minimum amount of stuff in this specification. So 
the stuff that's required is, is really focused on interfaces. And then uh, kind of what, uh, you know, particularly Shin was alluding to is we've got a lot of different appendices related to specific products that can be built on those uh, specifications, particularly around PowerShell. Right? You get a lot of different inputs and potentially different, you know, outputs, 12 volts or 48. Um, but the, the specification itself, the main one, doesn't tell you how big the power shelf is, how much power is coming out of it, how many rectifier modules there are. Um, so we're, we're hoping to kind of fill out more of those appendices with very specific product um, that uh, members of the community are interested in, in developing or, or using, depending upon, uh, um, as we go forward. So once. Once those product specifications are written, um, the next step is for, um, for us to have the product manufacturers present products against those specifications. Once those specifications are ready, then um, I and Brian would take those uh, to the incubation committee, and then the incubation committee would finally uh, vote up or down on whether you accept the specification, and then whether you get the uh, OCP accepted or the OCP inspired, um, and there's actually a whole talks on the differences between uh, accepted, inspired, and, and that whole process. Um, so if you're interested in either developing um, a specification as an appendix or as a particular product, um, then definitely talk to me or Brian and we can give you all the details of, of how to take, it, take you through that process. So yeah, thanks. Um, there any questions specifically on, on the, the information that we showed up here related to the changes to 2.0? Let's see how much time we got left. Anything? Pretty clear, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's a, uh, can, yeah, repeat the question. So. Yeah, so the question is uh, why the nominal voltage is 54.5, right? Um, well, I guess this is a uh, difficult question. And, uh, I think from uh, what we learned also from the telecom uh, applications, which is a minus 48 volt system, and you know, we try to leverage you know the same kind of technology or product products from then, right? Because it's uh, you know only the polarity or the grounding is different. Uh, so what we found the most common one, I think, is uh, fifty four point five, and that's how we made the decision there. Quite simple. Uh, they are, I guess, there are some relationships to uh, you know how the battery is operating in terms of uh, testing and you know how you detect your. Uh, Let's say your your the way that we one of the implementation um, that um, you know the way we detect the the AC short circuit the, the AC out outage like when you you have a the AC outage you you have to switch your your batteries right it's actually by detecting the uh, the DC voltage um, of the bus bar at some at some point so there are some relationships that we we um, we have to 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 concede so it's more like you know when we define a a nominal voltage, you know, leveraging um, the technology from um, technical um, areas, and then we kind of designed our battery unit to to accommodate that uh, that voltage. So it's you know, d define the nominal voltage first, and then design the whole system to kind of uh, make it uh, interconnecting uh, with, with this, the system. I mean, your question is, what do, do we know whether they're using lithium ion batteries? Yeah, so um, I think one of the key difference here is, you know, we, we put the battery, battery backup unit into the rack level, right? Um, and for telecom company, from my understanding is correct, is, you know, they put all these batteries, I don't know whether it's lithium ion battery or, or uh, lead acid batteries into a, a giant rooms, right, for, for distribution. So, so mainly I think the, uh, maybe there are some confusions here, like 
actually for for this open rack v2 what we are talking about is the 48 volt is really on the rack level power distribution right i mean is is the the 48 volt is is only limited into the the rack level and uh, versus the telecom company they have you know minus 48 volt which is really a a power distribution across the, the data center, right, the infrastructure level. Um, but I, I, I don't have too much information about what's, what they are using in terms of battery technology. Sorry, uh, I'm from Nokia, so I can comment a little bit about that uh, uh, that area. So um, I'm happy to see that, that currently how it is specified, so it keeps uh, doors open to specify also the minus 48 feet option. So the voltage range is exactly that what we are using in telco space, only to change the polarity. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the point of load converters, we can use the same. Mm, the oils uh, in both cases, so I can see clear benefit in there. And uh, for the batteries you're asking, so typically uh, we, we are using in, in, in uh, lead acid batteries in the battery rooms, so we don't have the lithium ion uh, still on, on the racks, but maybe in the future, so in a, a new data centers. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. But if I understand correctly, on, right now the new spec, you can do the 48 volts either positive or grounded. Is, am I correct? Uh, yeah, the, the, in the rack, the 48 volts is a positive 48 or it can be grounded as 40, minus 48. Can you do that option? Um, I, I think in this specification, we call it a positive 48 volt system, right? Um, but we believe in some of the, uh, some of the implementation, uh, implementation, actually by adding some, you know, adapters in, into the rack, you could easily make it into a, a minus 48 volt system. But that's, that portion is not yet in, included in, into the specification yet. Okay, so if you become minus 48, your downstream converter has to use isolation transformer, right? So your efficiency will be totally different. That's correct. Okay. And that's one of the reasons we moved to a positive 48 volt. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so we, we actually did look at uh, you know, how to implement the negative 48 volt in there, but none of the specific, none of the detail is, is incorporated into this. So um, certainly we, we were very uh, sensitive to make sure that you could enable, say, a negative 48 volt distribution to easily be implemented right at the power shelf level um, relatively simply using essentially the same power shelf with just a minor modification to it. Um, so we were sensitive to, the, to that, but the actual specification on how to go do that isn't included in here yet. So it'd be something we would add potentially into an, uh, an appendix or something like that. Yeah. So also as we were doing some of the, as we were doing some of the uh, design for the bus bar, we were thinking about provisions for areas where we can put keying features. So if you did have a rack that was set up for positive 48 or negative 48, you don't accidentally plug one into the other. So we wanted to define an area within the payload trays themselves that if you were to, to design a negative 48 tray, it does not accidentally go into a positive 48 volt for some of these reasons. But uh, we weren't able to get these changes into the spec in time, but we want to get everyone up to a point where they can start designing as early as possible. And our first version is the positive 48 for that higher efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my question is, it, it, uh, the 48 volt is hot swappable. Is that, well, under voltage, yes, but also under current? So if there is a load on, you can disconnect it? Uh, yes. Um, so that's how it's defined. It's, uh, even if you are running node, that you should be able to disconnect it. Uh, I think you, this is a very detailed of a technical things. And actually in one of the, the very interesting question, and actually in one of the, um, this section uh, into the detail of the specification, there's, 
I think there's one particularly uh, column for what we call the high power, high power tray removable from the, um, uh, the right lever, from the bus bar. Um, you know, if you are trying to cut off a, let's say, high power tray, let's say three kilowatts um, from the bus bar, right, you easily can create some issues, right? Um, so we actually introduced or put a some kind of guidelines um, into the specification how you should you know design your circuit to accommodate this kind of situation. Um, okay. You have all the details actually in the specification. You basically need to um, you know there's uh, in 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 the uh, connectors on the IT tray there's one pin called short pin, right? So basically when you remove it, uh, you know, you have a signal that you can send it to your downstream VRs and with a delay of milliseconds, right? And then you can start to cut off your load um, after you receive that signal. And then when you really remove the connection from the, the bus bar, you, you actually don't have any load uh, in, by, by, um, by the time when you, you, you remove the load. Uh, so it's actually a very smart way to do that. Uh, and it has been introduced in specification. Okay. It's a very good question. Okay. Thank you. Because as, as part of the design features, uh, the connector, it may look like a, a, a just one set of pins going across, but that's typically something that you don't see within a bus bar connection. Bus bar connections, usually all the pins are at the same distance, yeah. both sides, but we have a, a stagger on the bus bar side, and even within the connector, as Shin mentioned, there is one pin that's offset that's going off of the power side as well. Hi, shit. Um, so my question is, 12 volt uh, supplies are obviously mature and very optimized for cost and efficiency in today's world. The introduction of 48 volts sounds, you know, beneficial. So what do you see the relevance of 12 volt racks moving forward? I mean, are they going to disappear or is everybody going to migrate towards 48 volt in the future and how far out? Um. I think to, to your first point, right, uh, you know, um, the 48 volt is still a, a bit new, like you said, in, in some of the areas, and uh, you talk about, uh, you know, mature, mature, maturity of the uh, 48 volt system, right? And, you know, we, we, when we design the 48 volt system, we really look at, you know, the whole system, and when we talk about the power delivery all the way from, you know, um, AC to 48 volt to point load, you know, how you make your battery, how you design your, your bus bar, how you make your connections and things like that. Uh, so, and I, I think uh, as we, we had a panel yesterday, we talked about a lot of things about, you know, 48 volt rack versus 12 volt. I think one of the key uh, features for, um, uh, or benefits for um, 48 volt is when the rack power is high, right? It's becoming more and more attractive, and we do see a, a very clear trend of uh, increasing power in, in various applications. And you know, if you look at uh, um, GPU applications, you look at uh, different generations of the CPUs. You know, either from Intel, or from uh, other CPU vendors, the the power keep increasing, right? You know, um, so we think that you know when the power is it's increasing along with, with that, you know, 48 volt rack becoming more and more um, uh, attractive. And at some point, um, you know, in some of the application, you know, we may see a kind of a breakthrough on, on, on this evaluation. That's kind of my view. And, and part of what also happens is as you're going to high power racks, you'll start running into issues with cooling and it becomes harder and harder to cool. And that's actually one of the driving factors of why we decided to introduce a shallower depth rack because let's say you had uh, some GPUs that were very high power. You would not put many items that are sensitive downstream. So that's actually wasted space that you would just use for extended bus bars. So as the racks get higher and higher power, like some of them uh, that are available today that we, we've seen on the floor can handle up to 36 kilowatts within the, these essentially 19 inch racks. Yeah, could, could you describe the uh, 48 volt to processor load 
efficiency targets and then transient response requirements and what are acceptable trade-offs in terms of density and transient response versus efficiency? Uh, sorry, just for me to understand, you said from the 48 volt to point of load, right? Processor. To processor, okay. Um, well, so I think we, uh, you know, we of course try to get the, the most, you know, companying solutions, right, in terms of, uh, of efficiency and density. Um, and um, we, in, in, as part of the specification, I think we at least put some of the, the numbers over there uh, in the open rack v2 saying, you know, for a, a processor like Intel, which has a little bit high voltage, right, is 1.8 because of the 5R, they put it into the, the processor. Uh, I believe the uh, peak efficiency we defined is 93 uh, as a starting point. Um, and there are processors like, you know, ASICs uh, from the, the switches and, and uh, some other CPU vendors may have much lower uh, voltage, right, uh, which is close to 0.9 or, or, or 1 volt. And the efficiency target is slightly different. I, I think it's also part of the specification. We have some numbers over there. Um, um, and um, we also, uh, you know, it's another metrics I think as already mentioned is, you know, we have seen that the power density becoming uh, more and more critical uh, in in applications because, you know, they are trying to put more things into a, a one tray and, and make short um, kind of connections between trays and and for improving the latency and communication speed. Um, so we we have seen like density is is a, a huge trend now and and I think uh, there are many ways to to introduce uh, to to improve in that kind of area that what what we learned is you know you probably think about uh, uh, divided the conversion into different stages as one example um, and you could think about modularized design right you put all the components discrete components into a, a package and you know make it uh, uh, vertically or um, so there are many and and overall I think in general you know we have we have a kind of targeting number for the efficiency and of course you know we, we always want to have better efficiency right because uh, you know we, we don't want to pay the, the losses for for the conversion and we are seeing uh, um, more and more focus on the power power uh, density improvement uh, uh, driving the, the the power density improvement in this area as well I want to make a point that there's several of the vendors that are doing presentations later today yeah probably talk to that very specifically their solution yeah thank you Dave yeah, so uh, actually there are, uh, this is also new, I think, to OCP Summit that we actually, uh, because of the reason that 48 volt is relatively new to the community, and we actually have several, I think, VR vendors here uh, in this summit, and they're going to do some presentations about, you know, what their te technology, how they are in keeping improving the efficiency, and how they are doing for improving the density as well. Yeah, so feel free to to work around and, and, and join the discussion, I guess. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, guys. Um, really appreciate you guys sharing the spec with all of us here and the plans moving forward. I, uh, I work in the power cooling facility space and cabling plant design space. Uh, and from my perspective, if I'm trying to understand this, uh, I look at it and say you have facility level battery, let's say UPS systems feeding your facility in large facilities. And the concept of the power shelf, and you have potentially batteries sitting in there, uh, or likely some sort of rectifier possibly even sitting in there. What's your thoughts on the concept of maintenance of these systems, uh, battery systems, rectifier systems, and, and the thought of, of understanding, you know, their life cycle management in type in terms of, you know, facility management in, in, as a general whole, does that fall under the, the responsibility of, a, of a, a data center operator or does that fall under the responsibility of a, an IT individual and who's maintaining watching that system and, you know, I get what, you know what I mean, like, it's a great idea and I'm just kind of nervous on the maintenance side of things because it adds another layer of challenges. 
and it maybe it's more of a discussion item than it is a question. We, we actually have Dave here, so maybe he, he's the right person to ask this question. Yeah, this is Dave Alexander. I'm actually uh, Director of Engineering at Google that's responsible for a lot of these areas. So to your specific question, uh, at least within Google, we don't have facility level battery systems. All of our UPS is basically distributed, it's in rack, and it's actually maintained by the same personnel that maintains the, the servers, the storage, you know, the same sort of hardware operations folks that do the maintenance for that. Uh, and so it's, it's certainly something that's a major factor in what we look at, and one of the reasons, frankly, we've moved to lithium ion is it's got a longer life, maintenance is easier. So from that standpoint, uh, you know, at least for Google, um, because we don't use those kind of facility level sort of battery systems, uh, ours is all distributed, it, it, it's made it a fairly streamlined sort of maintenance operation for us. Certainly, it, for all of the Google facilities worldwide, that's the case. Now, there certainly are COLA facilities that Google uses and leverages that have sort of facility-level UPSs, but that's not something that necessarily we maintain. Obviously, the COLA provider does. Yep. As a part of the rack design, what, what's also happened is as we're designing the power shelves and the power shelves, that the power shelves and the battery shelves, they could be separate entities. Some of them are designed as a single unit, some are integrated, but others it's completely optional. Like, let's say you had a battery room, you don't necessarily need batteries within the rack and you only keep the, so it really depends on your design use case. All right, so unfortunately we're out of time. That's all we get. So uh, we can carry that discussion uh, out. I would have another last uh, question. It's yeah. a topic that came up in the data center project also because yeah. we're doing a colo chapter. So I mean, just we'll, that'll come, we'll up, that'll come up later. Yeah, that, that, we'll have more time later to discuss that particular thing. So thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, another five minutes. We'll start the, start the next one. Thank you. Well, a lot of good discussion. So thanks a lot. No Appreciate it.